if you think about it, when cows are grazing and many ruminants are grazing, it's very common that they do something that is incidental consumption of insects, right? Anything that is an arthropod, an insect that is just living in the grass, cows will end up eating it. Maybe not a lot of it, but it's not such a foreign thing for them to consume. So that's the first thing I would like to say. Now, there is a global interest in trying to find alternative sources of protein. So maybe in the U.S. we're not used to thinking about this very much, but because we have soybean meal and we can use it in nutrition, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing protein source, uh, plant source. But in many other countries, getting access to enough soybean meal and soybean products is very um, difficult, limited and expensive. everyone, this is Luis Ferreira with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we will be discussing a brand new topic in animal nutrition that you may or may not be aware of, but we want to learn more about insect feeding to cows. Is that possible? What are the issues and everything else related to that? And to shed some light into this very interesting and intriguing topic, we have Dr. Eduardo Rico from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us today. We are very happy to discuss this topic with you. But before you get into this uh, discussion, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Okay, well, um, thank you, Luis, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. This is my, my first time with your podcast. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am originally from Colombia, South America. Um, I studied animal science over there. Um, I focus a lot on, on nutrition, animal nutrition. I like ruminants. I found that very interesting animal to focus on. Uh, but yeah, my, my regular cap is the nutritionist, and I have expanded into studying how nutrition can influence metabolism and health. That's what I focus on, particularly now that I'm at the School of Veterinary Medicine of, of Penn. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I like doing. I, I have different topics that I to, like to explore around those areas. Omega-3 fatty acids and effects on health, inflammation, um, fatty acid supplementation in general. Ketosis is one other topic related to health. And more recently, well, the one that we're going to discuss today, which is uh, the, the use of this new alternative feed that is a potential source of protein for, for cows too. So yeah, that's kind of like the short of what I do. Looking to maximize your herd's potential? Elevate performance with Kemen's cutting edge encapsulation technologies, including rumen protected choline, methionine, and lysine. Kemen's advanced choline and amino acid technologies ensure precise nutrient delivery, boosting milk yield and enhancing herd health. Trust Kemen, the experts in encapsulation, to take your herd to the next level. Learn more today at kemen.com forward slash dairy. Let's talk about insects and how can we use that as an animal feeding strategy. So why is this becoming a topic of interest and how can we utilize those to make sure that we continue to move dairy nutrition forward? Yeah, so probably I would say with a, with a disclaimer or a caveat that probably it sounds very strange to some people to hear that we're thinking about feeding insects to cows. So the first thing I would like to say is that's not such a strange thing. If you think about it, when cows are grazing and many ruminants are grazing, it's very common that they do something that is incidental consumption of insects, right? Anything that is an arthropod, an insect that is just living in the grass, cows will end up eating it. Maybe not a lot of it, but it's not such a foreign thing for them to consume. So that's the first thing I would like to say. Now, there is a global interest in trying to find alternative sources of protein. So maybe in the U.S. we're not used to thinking about this very much, but because we have soybean meal and we can use it in nutrition, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing protein source, uh, plant source. But in many other countries, getting access to enough soybean meal and soybean products is very um, difficult, limited and expensive. So you may think about places where um, this is not so available or is very expensive to obtain and local sources of protein are not so available. You may want to have something extra in your palate, uh, you know, uh, options. So if you're talking about Asia or Europe, these things are becoming very important. What is an alternative feed that we can use that is high quality, good protein, and, and can help us alleviate costs? The other uh, reason for which we want to do this, or some people want to do this, is in terms of sustainable agriculture. How do we feed the planet making use of um, 
of the resources that we have. And insects happen to be a very important resource that in some situations could actually be low cost, not necessarily right now. I will make sure that that's clear. Not right now, especially in the U.S., you, it's not competitive against soybean meal. But there is a number of reasons for which you want to have a more, di more diverse number of options in, when it comes to feeding animals. And so in pet food industry, in fisheries, in poultry and swine, this already took off a while ago. And now the question is, is this something that we can explore also for the dairy cow or for ruminants in general? And so that's the reason. And, and I, I will just say maybe it's not the most obvious thing to do in the U.S. right now, but it's, it's an important thing to think about globally and maybe in, at some point even in, in some situations even in the U.S. So that's kind of like the reason for which we're looking at this. And you mentioned a little bit about uh, be a good protein source and maybe trying to compare a little bit with soybean meal. So tell us a little bit more about the nutrition perspective uh, or nutritional perspective of uh, feeding insects. And how does that compare with uh, key uh, protein sources like soybean meal and maybe other sources that we have available, canola meal, cottonseed meal? Uh, how, how do you see that uh, feeding insects uh, in comparison to those? Well, first with soybean meal, uh, which is the, the, the traditional one we think about when we're feeding cows, dairy cows in particular, Compared to that, what we know so far is that the amino acid profile of that protein is very, very good. Okay, so it competes very well in terms of the profile of amino acids, especially essential amino acids that you want to give a dairy cow is bypass protein, for example. Uh, the other thing is that the content of protein can be very high. So if you're talking about, for example, soybean meals about 50% protein uh, on a dry matter basis, you're, you're doing that or more with some meals. Like, for example, crickets are in the neighborhood of 60 or 70% protein crickets. Uh, the one that we're using is black soldier fly larva. That's something that can vary a lot, you know, depending on a number of uh, factors. But you can think of use these insects being between 30 and 70% in some cases, protein. So uh, the ones we're using right now are around 50%. And again, with a very good amino acid profile. Uh, in many cases, compete very well against fish meal. Like, for example, you're thinking about uh, fisheries and, 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 you know, people who are growing um, these carnivore fish. Um, like trout and stuff like that, it becomes a sustainable alternative in many situations. So again, in other countries possibly. So, but from the nutritional standpoint, I was very interested because it seems to be a very good protein source. Maybe it's not intuitively the, intuitively the most obvious one to go first as a source in, uh, alternative source, but it seems to be very good. So uh, I'm interested in exploring those aspects and also the probably negative aspects. So maybe you didn't ask about this necessarily, but I want to know, for example, if the exoskeleton of the insects, which is made out of chitin, which is a polysaccharide, um, a bit similar to cellulose, but a bit different too, uh, could actually act as an anti-nutritional factor. And this is something that could play against, you know, nutrient digestion in dairy cows. So we're doing some of that work now because we're trying to answer those questions. But in principle, it just looks like it compares really well to any other proteins that we rank very highly already. So why not look at it, right? No, and I think it's great to understand the potential anti-nutritional factors, right? Because at the end of the day, if there is anything that may impair uh, consumption or any other animal function because of a feed, we have to be aware so we can properly navigate uh, how to formulate diets and so on. So I think you are on spot there to make sure that this can be truly utilized on farm. Uh, said that, do you see any potential barriers uh, for the adoption of uh, insect feeding? Uh, I'm actually curious about not only uh, logistics and diet related factors, but if you see a potential uh, social uh, factor inhibiting some nutritionists maybe to use those feeds. Yeah, we're actually doing some work right now trying to understand whether farmers are um, you know, open to using this type of alternative feed because uh, whether it is for animal consumption or human consumption directly, there is there is this um, fear factor that is called entomophobia. Like we're afraid of insects, in many cases disgusted by insects. So in some cases, even people may just not necessarily feel okay with the idea that their animals eat the insects. So that's two steps. We're trying to understand that, assess that at the farmer level, and we're, we're starting some work here from my previous student from uh, from the University of Maryland, try to poll people and understand what they're, they're thinking. And the other level, we're doing a collaboration with um, a, a someone in Europe at the University of Turin, trying to understand the, the perceptions of consumers 
related to, to what if you get a milk that comes from a cow that consumes insects in some capacity, um, which is important to remind people about what I said in the beginning. Actually, cows already eat insects, right? It's not such a strange thing anymore. And we need to remember that it's kind of like part of the natural ecosystem in which they move or move, I should say. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to understand that it's, it's probably a barrier and we are very early in the story to be able to be sure, you know, that it, it makes sense for people to want to use it. But uh, it's, 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 um, it's something that we want to know because if it becomes an alternative to to be used as a source of protein, we need to make sure that the farmers are on board and that the consumers are going to accept, right? Because the Western world in particular is very, say, in a way, afraid of insects. So there is a big barrier there. And I think that's one of the biggest ones. When you go to Asia, for example, um, that's not a big deal, not necessarily. That population is, is usually um, known for consuming in many places, many countries in Asia, Eastern Asia in particular, consuming insects. So that, that is not a novel factor for them. But for us, it's like, wait, 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 what do you mean with insects, right? So we need to overcome some barriers. No, and I think to add to this, I think uh, some of the countries in Asia, they also optimize every possible piece of land to produce food. Right, because of the needs of the the human population. So, given that, uh, probably they truly understand why they have to figure out different ways of uh, feeding not only animals but feeding humans as well. Right. So, I think that certainly is a barrier that is less likely to happen there than anywhere here. Actually, talking about efficiency of the land, the use of land. You can do vertical farming of insects. So you can actually save a lot of space and produce a lot of good quality biomass in, in a very limited amount of space. So from the standpoint of sustainable agriculture, there is a number of positives, you know, to 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 talk about when you talk about insects. Um, so, yeah, definitely Asia is a bit, I, I've been uh, a bit ahead in terms of acceptance, uh, but it would be interesting to see what where we get with that here. It doesn't have to be this hard to keep cows pregnant. At Virtus Nutrition, we understand the negative impact that lost pregnancies have on a dairy's economics. Every failed pregnancy means more money spent on expensive semen, additional replacements to raise, and fewer valuable beef calves to sell. Feed what embryos need. Strata with EPA DHA, the pregnancy nutrient. No, and I do think there's a lot of potential. So, so tell us some insights uh, from your research. Uh, what did you already learn about uh, some of those strategies to use insects as animal feeding? And where do you see this research going next? All right. So we just completed the first animal experiment. And so we fed this to dairy cows. Um, we don't have the full results yet. We're, we're working on that now. But when you look at the preliminary data so far, it doesn't seem like when you replace part of the soybean meal of the diet, it doesn't seem that the cows will crash in terms of performance. If you balance your diet for protein and amino acids, which we were we try to be very careful about, it seems that so far there is not such a big difference, which is promising in, in, in the context that if you want to really replace part of that soybean meal and reduce dependence or reliance on, on that particular single ingredient, there may, this may be a decent alternative, right? So we're trying to compare just the substitution. Uh, at this point, we did it with 25% substitution of the soybean meal. Um, so around 2% of the diet uh, on dry matter basis. And so far, so good, but again, it's, it's preliminary. One of the things we're looking at is what's happening inside of the rumen, because we want to see if the fat from the, because these insects are actually usually very high in fat. It can be from 10 to 30% fat. And a lot of this fat is uh, medium chain fatty acids like lauric acid and muristic acid, particularly lauric acid. And we know those from when we think about coconut and things like that in the rumen of a cow, that could be a disaster, right? So we are actually working with defatted meals to make sure that we are not overwhelming the rumen of these animals. And in those conditions, so far, as I said, it seems like the data is showing not a big dramatic effect on any reduction. So it seems that the cows are holding well. That's what we know so far, but we are trying to complement this with more analysis, uh, doing um, in vitro analysis of this, so batch cultures and things like that, and also in situ. So we're doing the, you know, the, the different steps with the nylon bags and trying to look at digestion rates and see if the chitin factor of the exoskeleton is actually a problem or not for nutrient digestion. We're trying to attack it from different angles. So far, it seems like it's an acceptable protein source, but until we don't get the real final results, this is a little bit of a... Um, 
preliminary and speculative, but yeah, it's, it's looking not bad. No, absolutely. And 25% is actually quite a high replacement level if you think about uh, protein type of studies, right? Yeah. Uh, and people typically start with a little bit less and slowly progress towards <laughs> replacing more and more. So I, I think it's really promising. And It was a bit of um, an unknown, but we had some in vitro data. There was a, a group in Japan, I remember that they did in vitros and they showed that they could get 25% or higher without too much of a disruption in the rumen. So we thought this could be a good diet if the cows eat it. And we found that in a preliminary testing of palatability, like acceptance, uh, most cows were okay with it. But you find every once in a while, you find a picky cow that is like, hmm, this, this smell is weird. And it takes them maybe two or three days to fully get back to 100% intakes. Um, that was the main concern. But most cows actually ate it very well with that 25% substitution, which, as you say, that's actually pretty high. In our case, it was around 2% of the ration dry matter. So we're talking about maybe, what, 500 grams or so? That's that's a full more than a full pound. So it's sizable. Yeah, yeah no, it's a considerable amount for sure yeah. and yeah. looks really promising. Uh, Eduardo, thank you so much for sharing these insights with us. I'm really intrigued about what your research uh, show us next and hope we continue to learn more and more about how to better implement that to the industry. Thank you at home for joining us today and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.